Okay, this is that where yeah at is kind of a joke. It's not really very funny, but I'll explain where it came from. Um, I was traveling to New Orleans one time, and it was like my trip here last night. I got in real late at night, and um, it was back when airplanes weren't completely full. And uh, I went and got my luggage, and hardly anybody else was around. He sees me walk up, and he goes, where yet? And I thought, where yet? Well, boy, <laughs> what does that mean? Well, he was asking where I was at, where I was staying at. So um, I've always liked that phrase, where yet? You know, so where you at, AIDD, in terms of, you know, looking at all of this stuff. And um, today the definition has elements of a medical deficit-based conceptualization as well as elements of a social ecological conceptualization. The lack of a reliable and valid assessment, uh, reliable valid assessment tools to measure the person environment mismatch or the intensity of someone's support needs is one reason for continuing an operational definition that calls for measuring deficits. Um, if we are going to make progress in understanding people um, by their support needs, we need tools to measure support needs. Oftentimes, progress in any field is related to the ability to measure something that's considered important. Um, if you think about medical technology, if we didn't have a way to measure temperature of the body, how limited we would be, you know, and machines, you know, so um, pressure, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things. If you can measure something, you have a much better understanding of it. Um, so the sports intensity scale was developed for that purpose, to move the field forward so that we'd have a way to measure. Um, people by their intensity of support needs. Um, and this last little bullet is a disclaimer. Um, I've drawn a di uh, sort of a dichotomy between a medical model and a sociological model. There are different ways of understanding disability. So there's humanistic models and all sorts of things. You know, they, they get kind of complex. So I just kind of have stuck to this um, dichotomy between these two. Um, but um, I think we do have a long way to go before we have a unifying conceptualization of disability. So the distinction is this is sort of like an adaptive behavior scale and it is completed through a structured interview. So in that way it has that commonality. Okay. Um, there are some key differences um, between the two. I'm going to stick to the script for just a second, though. I'm going to, um, because I want to talk about this. Um, here's some definitions. Supports are resources and strategies that improve functioning and personal outcomes. It's not, not a profound definition, but that's what it does, okay? If it doesn't improve your outcomes, and if it doesn't improve your functioning, then it's not a support. Um, with adult services, this is really important when I talk to adult groups, because we have a lot of things in our system that are traditional service system types of things, but they don't necessarily improve functioning or outcomes. And so, um, we want to start aligning our service system so that that becomes the indicator. For this individual, does it improve functioning, does it improve outcomes? Support needs we're defining as a psychological construct. So that is something inside the person. Okay? So it's like anxiety or depression or intelligence. You can be high in it, you can be low in it. Okay? Support needs refer to the pattern and intensity of supports necessary to participate in culturally valued normative activities of daily life. If someone has an extraordinary support need, it means that there's a degree of mismatch between the person's personal competency and the demands of everyday environments that most others in society do not experience. And you have a copy of the supports intensity scale, and that was developed to measure the intensity of people with a diagnosis of IDDD. Okay, so this isn't norm referenced on 
the entire population. This is normed referenced on people with a diagnosis of intellectual disability and related developmental disabilities. I should just really say intellectual disability, but I put that in there because there are several kids that, and especially in the adult system, where they really have, maybe their primary disability is autism, but they would also qualify as a person with intellectual disability. It measures the intensity of people's support needs using a uniform procedures. Um, it doesn't identify personalized supports. Okay, so it's a global measure, but there's a difference between identifying personalized supports for that person and getting an overall relative measure of the person's intensity of support needs. Um, personalized supports really need to be identified through a planning process, through a person-centered planning process where people say, for this individual, they need Jim Thompson here to provide this type of support in the morning. And they need a, do I have my phone with me? You know, uh, smartphone to give them alarms when they need to take their medicine or to, you know, cue them when they need to get off the bus or something like that. So those are personalized supports. And the only way to identify personalized supports is to outline someone's day and environments and figure out who is going to support the person or what technology is needed to support the person, what activities they're going to be involved in. And then there are going to be certain supports that need to go across the day. Because if it's a vulnerable population and the person does have some risk of being exploited in some sort of way or um, you know, putting themselves in danger, those types of supports would need to go across the day, whether it be a phone to call somebody, you know, you push this face, push this button, if you get in trouble, and that activates a GPS, and that tells us exactly where you are, or whether it's, um, you know, whatever it might be, a companion dog or something like that. So it would be some things that might go across the person's day, but when you're talking about personalized supports, you're really talking about what supports does a person need to be involved in these settings, these activities. And this scale sets a backdrop for it, but doesn't get to that type of detail. Okay? That can only be done through discussions. There. Um, here are some assumptions on which the scale is based. People with intellectual and related developmental disabilities need supports over and above those needed by people from the general population. Support needs will vary from person to person. Therefore, the supports a person needs will vary in number and nature. All right, so some people will need lots of supports. Some people need only a few. Some people need very intense supports. Some people will need less intense supports. And the CIS was developed to measure support needs using a uniform procedure that would allow people's relative intensity of support to be compared. Um, it was developed to assess support needs fairly from a psychometric standpoint in terms of it needed to be reliable, it needed to be valid. So now if I'm doing a CIS assessment in Indiana and the person moves to Illinois and someone else does one there and then they move to Iowa, something's wrong with the scale unless everyone comes up with pretty much the same scores. And so, you know, time, place, assessor, all of that needs to be um, you know, not, not a huge influence. Okay. So if you look at your cyst, and um, you see the first page there, that is just, um, you know, the, the identifying information. The cyst is done with one interviewer and two respondents. So you have to talk to at least two people. Okay, now as the interviewer I can talk to you and then I can go talk to you and then I can come back and make the ratings. The interviewer makes the ratings. Okay. You don't do the two people, you do them at separate It's really better to do it the other way, but you can. <laughs> and I think it's much better to sit down with a family and others and do it as a group interview. But there's a real difference between 
I have to bring this group to consensus on a rating. That's not your burden as an interviewer. Your burden as an interviewer is to listen carefully, to ask the question, follow the probes, and then decide on the rating. So for example, if I'm doing an interview and, and this one does not have, this has lifelong learning activities, but the school version has, has, has a lot of school type items. The teacher or the paraprofessional or others that know the child's functioning at school may have more reliable, useful information for those items. But the parent may have a lot more useful information for the home living items. Um, there are ways to probe to see if somebody is overestimating somebody's support needs or underestimating support needs. Um, with the adult scale, a lot of times people with intellectual disability themselves are one of the respondents. Now what our research has shown on that is, is they're actually their responses are very reliable with others who know them quite well. Okay, so if I'm talking to an adult with an intellectual disability and they rate them, themselves as having rather intense support needs compared to others, then the adults will also rate themselves as having more intense support needs. If I talk to somebody who has rates themselves as having less intense, so will the others who know them. However, it's a parallel graph in terms of the people with intellectual disability regularly and consistently rate themselves as having somewhat less intense support needs than others in their life. And so that's just important for an interviewer to know. That if you're including a person with intellectual disability, um, their perceptions of the supports they need are not going to be, you know, are going to be less intense than other people. And that can be a real concern when you're talking about vulnerability issues. Um, also, sometimes other people involved with a person with intellectual disability are overprotective. And so, you know, you, you have to listen, but, um, you know, it's been interesting that the research shows that you don't get these wildly divergent estimates. Um, people are very consistent. All right, so page one is just that, you know, the, the, who's the respondents, who's the interviewer, this is the information. On page two, we get into section one, and I did not give you a manual. You can, you can buy one from AIDD. I do not get any royalties from this scale, so I'm not trying to get rich off you, but um, you really do if you're interested in this. And this is, a lot of schools are using this as a transition planning tool. Um, you need to get the manual and um, it gives you descriptions of all those activities, okay? Now she asked in the back, or in, in sort of towards the back, um, how is this different than an adaptive behavior scale? And one way it's different is these are broad items for the most part, okay? Um, housekeeping and cleaning is a much broader item then can the person um, use a vacuum cleaner? Can the person dust? And so with each of these items, we provide a description. And during the interview, you have to consider the items in their totality. Now, some items will have essential elements to them that are more important, like um, taking care of clothes. Take care of clothes, laundering is a big part of that. But there's more to it. There's also putting the clothes away. There's minor repairs, you know, and um, what support does the person need in terms of frequency, in terms of time, in terms of type? So how often? Frequency, time, what's the duration involved? And then type is more on the classic behavioral scale in terms of least to uh, most intensive prompts from um, you know, monitoring is all the person needs to um, full physical assistance. And so the, the scale is completed through an interview. Interview, one interviewer and at least two respondents. The interviewer must probe and make scoring judgments if respondents disagree. Group interviews are okay, probably better. The three dimensions are frequency, time, and type. Um, it's very useful to give respondents a copy of the rating key so you don't have to keep explaining it, is, is what we've learned. Um, you have to consider multiple tasks within an activity. 
and it's not can the person do it, it is in order to have a successful experience in this activity, in order to successfully participate, which is different than can a person do, but in order to fully and successfully participate in this activity. And the activities range from using a toilet to if we go to lifelong learning to um, using technology for learning. So they're disparate activities. You know, some are more complicated than others. But for the person to successfully participate, what support does the person need? Um, when an individual is not currently performing an activity, then people have to make an educated guess. So, you know, you get that a lot with adults who aren't employed. And all these employment activities are related to community environments. So, um, interacting with coworkers. Well, he doesn't work, you know, um, he, or he works at the sheltered workshop. And, you know, but what if he worked at Walgreens, you know, in a position where he was stacking shelves, doing other things around the store, how much support would he need to interact with his coworkers? You know, boy, he's never had a job like that. Well, there's an advantage to actually pushing people to envisioning somebody in environments that maybe they haven't had a chance to participate. And the data shows that actually these are very reliable and valid scores. They're, the psychometrics on this scale are just as good as on an adaptive behavior scale. And so, um, that causes people some distress that don't want to envision folks in different environments, but actually it's, it's a very valid way to do it. Um, at the end of the day, you get two indices. You get the support needs index as well as a support needs profile. And so if we go to the very back page, what you would do is you'd add up all your scores and there's a norm table just like other standardized tests and you get a sum of scores and that would give you a composite rating, okay? And the mean is 100, so it is just standardized like an IQ test. Um, if you have lower than 100, it means you have relatively less intense support needs than the standardization sample than other people with intellectual and related developmental disabilities. If you have over 100, then you have relatively more intense support needs. So somebody who had a score of 80 would have relatively less in intense support needs. Um, somebody who had a score of 125 would have relatively more intense support needs. Um, it will give you a total score. This person scored 99. And so they were right by the mean. And um, there's their score of 99 circled there. And you'll see there was some bounce between subscales for this person. The last two sections are, um, we have a protection advocacy section. And that's not norm referenced. We just ask people to, we think those items are important. So ask people to list those items. And then there's a medical and behavioral section and what support is needed to manage medical conditions or um, deal with problem behaviors. And um, those can kind of serve as red flags. So if somebody has some significant medical or behavioral concerns, it's an indication that their um, overall support rating may be underestimating their support needs. For example, if somebody is suicidal, then they may need support all day long. Now with the children's one, um, that is, to answer his good question, um, that's going to be normed on different age groups because a five-year-old typically developing child is going to need more support than a 15-year-old typically developing child. All right, And so that is going to be referenced against their particular age. But we didn't want to come up with different scales for five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds. And so we came up with items that we felt apply to all the ages, but the scores will not. And so you'll get the scores and then go to the norm tables for that age.